Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm happy to be able to be here with you this morning. And not just this morning, but throughout the whole week, this evening and each evening throughout the week. And if I were to ask right now, I think every hand would go up. How many would like to have better health than what they have right now? But you know, God has provided everything necessary so that we can have better health. So this morning, we're going to give the introduction to the health seminar that we'll be presenting throughout this whole week. And, um, you know, we are a privileged people. We are blessed people because God has given us a special message about health. Sad to say, many times we pride ourselves about it, but we really don't live it. So I am praying that throughout this week you may learn some simple practical things that will help you to be able to put into practice these health principles that God has given us as a people so that we may truly be the healthiest people on the, on the earth. Okay? You know, health isn't something that just happens by chance or luck. Sometimes people think that they get sick because of bad luck. <laughs> I don't believe in luck, okay? I believe everything is in the providence of God or as a result of our own disobedience, okay? And so as we go through this seminar this week, it's my desire that each one of you can come to understand this more clearly. And it is a seminar on health and happiness. Is it possible for us to be happy even if we're sick? Have you ever thought of that? It is possible. But how many sick people do you know that are really happy? <laughs> As a general rule, sickness and happiness kind of don't go together, okay? In most cases, people that are sick are gloomy, sad, depressed, okay? But God wants us to be a happy people. And we can be a happy people and a healthy people, all right? So we're going to be discussing through this week some simple basic principles that will help us have the happiness and the health that we need. One of them will be pure air. Another topic will be sunshine and your health. These are just simple things that God has given us, the gift of our will. And that's an amazing topic. I don't want any of you to miss it. Okay, I think, and you'll hear me say this about each of the topics. I think this is the most important one. <laughs> but each of them are important. Nature's thirst quencher. What is it? Pure water. Absolutely. And we'll be discussing the importance of exercise. Actually, the night that we talk about exercise, which will be Thursday night, I'd like to invite you to come dressed in exercise clothes because I'm going to invite you to do some exercises with me. And I'll demonstrate a couple of different routines. Simple, easy routines that you can do at home every day and guarantee that you'll feel better after a couple of weeks of doing them. All right? Then we're going to talk about the original diet. You've heard the saying, you are what you eat? Ah, well, we're going to discuss that quite at length. Actually, that night, you can come expecting to stay here until midnight, okay? Because <laughs> that's a long topic. Um, we're going to talk about rest. I didn't get to that one. Let me comment about that. We're going to talk about rest, physical, mental, and spiritual rest. That'll be next Friday evening's topic. And next Sabbath, for the 11 o'clock service, we will be finishing with trust in God and in His promises. Okay? So, this is just an introduction today, what we'll be talking about, about, and I'm sure most of you have recognized that these are the eight laws of health. Okay? And as we discuss them, I'll be sharing with you personal experiences that we've had through the years with patients as we've taught them these simple things and how God has blessed them. I'll be sharing with you scientific background to support these things, okay? And I think you'll enjoy it greatly with God's blessing. And 
You know, God's desire for his people is that we prosper and be healthy. And he wants us to prosper physically, mentally, spiritually, and financially, actually. Believe it or not. So many times we struggle and we think we don't have what we need. But let me share this with you. Back in the ancient times, there were some very wealthy people that followed God. Am I right? How about Abraham or Job? You know, these are some very wealthy people. In their times, they were multi-billionaires. <laughs> okay? And so, um, Solomon, of course, was a very, very wealthy person. And so, it's not wrong to be wealthy. It's putting our trust in our wealth that makes it wrong. Okay? So, God wants us, and let me just share this too. <laughs> a simple thing. Being debt-free is actually being wealthy. Okay? Because most people today, even though they may have material things, they don't own it. The bank owns it. Okay? So, being debt-free is a real blessing. And it's being wealthy. It's being prospered by God's blessings. And we should strive to be debt-free. Okay? You know, the Lord Jesus was asked at one time which of the commandments was the most important one. And he answered using an Old Testament text by saying, Hear, Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord one is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. So here we're able to see clearly that God wants allegiance to him by us, by his subjects, by our entire being. Now, I've had some people tell me, oh, I love God. From here up, I love God, but from here down, I do whatever I want to do. Now, is that possible? Not really. Not really, okay? Because a city divided amongst itself will fall. And if one is divided in his own self, and the Bible talks about those who are double-minded, okay? that it's not a good thing. They're like a wave of the sea that's tossed here and there by the wind. And so God wants us to be single-minded and all our attention be focused on him and doing his will. But then he went on saying, but the second is like unto it, that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. Now that's an interesting thought. Many times we really don't spend time meditating on those words. But you know, if we love ourselves enough that we don't want to harm ourselves, how would we want to harm others? But sad to say, there's many, many people today that don't love themselves enough to not harm themselves, okay? By using alcoholic beverages and drugs and eating things that they know they shouldn't that are harmful to them and so forth. So it's important that we understand the importance and how we should love ourselves. And as we love ourselves then, we can love others the way Jesus has loved us also. So that's an important point. Now, many people will tell me, oh, Dr. Dance, I can do whatever I want to with my body. It's mine. Well, is it? Do our bodies belong to us? No, they don't. Our bodies don't belong to us. And Paul helps us understand this when he says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? And why is it that we're not our own? He goes on to say in the next verse, for you were bought with a price. And what was that price? Christ's blood on the cross of Calvary. And because we are bought with a price, we should glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. So again here, it brings out the point that we should glorify God in our entire being. Not just our thoughts, not just our words, but in our entire being and what we do, what we think, what we say, everything should be focused on glorifying God or representing His character because representing God's character is His glory. Okay? So these are just a couple of verses to help us understand the importance of caring for our body uh, Paul also says in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And then he goes on saying, If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God 
is holy, which temple you are. Now some might get the idea with this verse that Jesus is a, a, a harsh, uh, strict God just waiting for us to make a mistake to punish us. <laughs> no, it's not that way. Okay? It's important that we understand that when something bad happens in our life, in most cases, it's directly related to our own disobedience. Okay? And I like to illustrate that by telling a story back years ago when our first two daughters were young. They were four and two. Our third daughter wasn't born yet. It was a Sabbath afternoon. I was out with, on a walk with them. And I had the two-year-old on my shoulders and the four-year-old was walking along and we came to a small canal, maybe six feet across, maybe three feet deep. The water was only five or six inches deep, maybe ten. And there was a small log across as a bridge. And so when we got there, I reached down to take my four-year-old's hand to help her cross that. And she says, no, I can do it myself. So I stepped back and said, okay. And I watched. And she started out across the little log. And when she got halfway, what do you think happened? <laughs> she fell off into the water. Okay? Now, did I push her into the water? Was it my fault she fell in the water? Okay? No, it wasn't. Now, of course, once she was in the water, she started crying, Daddy, why didn't you help me? <laughs> now, had she, the moment she felt she was going to fall, said, Daddy, I'd have been right there to take her hand and help her. And that's the way God is with us. He's waiting for us to recognize our need of Him, and He's right there ready to help us. Okay? Of course, as soon as she fell in, I was right there to help her get up out of the canal. Okay? It really didn't hurt her, just got her wet. But the interesting thing is that when bad things happen, in most cases, now we know there are a few exceptions, like Job, okay? We know Job's ailments and problems and disasters all happen directly because of it, satanic intervention, okay? But in many, many cases, what happens to us in our life is related directly to our own disobedience to the simple laws of health, okay? And it's important that this help us to reason from cause to effect, okay? And um, as we reason from cause to effect, we can almost always know exactly why we're sick. If we think back, what did I eat? Did I not sleep well enough? Did I, was I, did I get cold for too long period of time? And we can almost always figure out exactly why we're sick. All right? And so that's really an important point. Now, I want to share with you just a little bit about the history of my family. And I'm just really privileged and blessed to be a fifth generation Seventh-day Adventist. Now, that doesn't ensure my salvation. <laughs> my salvation depends on my own personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? But my father's, father's grandfather, okay, was a Seventh-day Adventist. He actually went through the great um, disappointment of 1844, and accepted the Sabbath truth and became a minister of the gospel. His name was George Washington Dents, <laughs> believe it or not. And on my father's mother's side, her father was also a minister. And my grandmother actually attended a little church in north central New York State in a little church called Roosevelt Church. I don't know if anybody ever heard about that little church. But across the street from that church is a uh, cemetery where the gravestone of Hiram Edson is. And I saw that gravestone several times when I was a kid growing up. And as my grandmother was growing up, several times Ellen White came to that church to preach. So my grandmother was nine and ten years old and she met Ellen White. And, and heard her preach there at the Roosevelt Church. Anyway, on my mother's side, her parents came over from Switzerland and they learned about the gospel message here in the United States and um, became Seventh-day Adventists when my mom was five years old. So I just praise the Lord. But the interesting thing is the health message really wasn't something that all of them practiced. My grandmother did, my father's mother, 
She was a vegetarian for over 75 years of her life. She lived to be 98 years old and died standing on her feet. The day she died, she had written some letters and took them out to the mailbox herself. She never spent a day in the hospital. When she was 84, she broke her knee. That was the only time she ever went to the hospital. You know, so praise the Lord. And it's really interesting because after she dropped the mail in the mailbox out by the street, came back in, my aunt, she was at my aunt's house in New York. And just a month before, she'd flown from California to New York by herself. My aunt says, Mom, come and eat. And so she went to the restroom, washed her hands, and came. When she got to the dining room, she held onto the back of the chair and said, you know what, I just really feel tired today. And my aunt got up. She was already sitting, and she come up, came over and hugged her mom and said, well, Mom, what do you expect? You're 98 years old. And she just sighed a big sigh, and her body went limp, and she stopped breathing. That was the end. So, you know, it's amazing. When we live the principles of health, we don't need to die an agonizing death. Okay? Now, my grandfather was different. He was an Indian. He part Indian. And he was a hunter. He killed over 400 deer in his lifetime, over 50 of which he shot with a bow and arrow. Okay? He raised his family, his six kids, with deer meat and with fish and turkey and pheasants and so forth. He was a hunter. And so my dad grew up eating meat and my mom was raised on a dairy farm. And so when they got married, they continued eating like they had been raised to eat. Lots of dairy. And my grandparents being from Switzerland, well, my grandma made wonderful Swiss cheese and all kinds of good stuff. Well, <laughs> believe it or not, my folks, both of them, suffered from different ailments. Uh, my mom suffered for 18 years with asthma and allergies and visiting doctors and going to specialists and never had any... any help with her problem. My dad, because after he married, started college, he was studying theology and medicine at the same time because he wanted to be a medical missionary to South America. And at the same time, raising family one after another. Well, believe it or not, in his third year, he took sick with stomach ulcers, bleeding stomach ulcers, hemorrhaging ulcers. And the doctor told him before the end of that year that he had to quit the university or he would die. He was 21 years of, old, a, of age. And he quit the university, went back to central New York State, bought a big farm and set up a sawmill business. And for seven years, suffered with terrible stomach pains and frequently have these bouts where he would vomit blood and pass out and just a really sick man. And you know, one day after one of these bouts, my mom rushed into the doctor and the doctor, after examining him, said, look, Dents, if you don't allow me to do surgery on you today, you won't live to see the day of tomorrow, the light of tomorrow. He was 28 by this time. And so he said, well, let me go home and get somebody to stay with the kids. I was the baby at that time. And um, they, he told the doctor, we'll meet you at the hospital. Now, it was 50-some miles to the hospital. And they didn't have any 911 service back then. So my mom drove him back home. He was laying in the back seat of the car. They got somebody to stay with us kids and then they headed for the hospital. Now a very unique thing happened. They went through the little town of Vienna, New York, where the church was that they were members at. And it was Wednesday night. Because of everything that was happening, they had totally forgotten it was Wednesday. And the pastor and some of the brothers and sisters were there for a prayer meeting. And my mom says, should we stop and let them know we're on our way to the hospital? And my dad said, yes, let's do that. So my mom pulled into the parking lot, went in and told the pastor, and he called the brothers and sisters that were there, come on, let's go pray for Brother Dents. And they came out and knelt on the, on the ground beside the car with the door open and had a prayer. It was just a simple, to the point prayer, bless them as they go on to the hospital, direct the hand of the surgeon, help them to recuperate quickly and to be back with us soon. And they went on their way. They got to the hospital, they took him in quickly and began doing whatever tests necessary to prepare him for the surgery. After a couple of hours of a lot of activity, they wheeled him to a room and they had him in observation for three days. On the third day, the doctors came and says, Mr. Dennis, you can go home. And my dad thought, am I so sick they're not going to do anything for me? Are they going to let me die? And the doctor said, you don't have ulcers. And my dad said, what? 
You can't tell me I've suffered all these years for nothing. Now he said, I didn't say you didn't have. He said, but you don't have ulcers. And it wasn't until that point that my dad realized that when they prayed for him beside the car there in the parking lot of the church, God had touched him and healed him instantly. There weren't even scar tissues. He was completely healed. And so, and I must say a little bit more about my mom. For over 18 years, as I mentioned, she'd been suffering with asthma and allergies. It wasn't until like four years later that my dad had been studying into natural remedies. He got a hold of a book called Back to Eden. How many of you know the book Back to Eden? Great book. And he began realizing the relationship that exists between what we eat and how we feel physically. And so he suggested to my mom, why don't you try it for a month and see what happens? <laughs> Cut out all dairy, all white flour and white sugar, all animal products, and let's see what happens. And in a month's time, she was totally healed of her asthma and allergies and never had it again. So my dad says, well, if it's good enough for her, it's good enough for all of us. <laughs> and so by then, all eight of us were born and my folks decided to make that change. Now, it wasn't easy to make a change, especially as kind of like pioneers, because at that time, there really weren't anybody in our church or in our area that was living the life style of the Seventh-day Adventists the way we're supposed to be living it. And believe it or not, the greatest perse persecution we got was from the brothers and sisters of our own church. <laughs> they wanted to disfellowship my dad and all kinds of stuff. But anyway, before that change, with a family of eight, you can imagine, if one gets sick, everybody gets sick. And we were off to the doctor all the time. But after we made that change, never again did we ever step foot into a doctor's office. Isn't that amazing? So that's a powerful evidence that living the natural lifestyle that God gave us as a people really has results. Now that doesn't mean we're never sick. But when we did get sick, my folks knew what to do at home with simple things, with water, okay? And we'll discuss more of that as we go through the week. But which one of those is me? Can anybody tell? No. <laughs> that little guy right there. That was the 27th of September of 1964. No, I'm sorry, 1967. 1967. And I remember that date very well because that was the day I was baptized. Okay, I was baptized in the river out across from the church. So anyway, um, I praise the Lord. And we're in order of age, actually. My mom, my mom and dad aren't. My mom was older than my dad, but from my sister on down, we're in order of age. And um, that was on the farm we had up in New York. So I praise the Lord for having been raised in a family that put these principles into practice. And then in 1970, um, my dad sold the farm and we moved to Mexico and my dad took charge of a 22-bed sanitarium. And um, I was his right-hand man there for four years as we worked and helped. And that's where I met my wife and the rest is all history. Anyway. <laughs> my dad began thinking after that day that the doctor told him that he could go home that Jesus told a man that had been healed once See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And my dad began to think, what was it that I was doing before that had me sick? And what must I do now not to get sick again? Because he definitely didn't want to have stomach ulcers again ever. <laughs> okay? And so that's what inspired him to start studying into a healthy lifestyle. And that's when God began revealing to him the simple things about diet and about pure air and water and so forth. Now, we must ask ourselves, what is disease? Have you ever asked that question to yourself? What is disease? And you know, it's sad because a lot of the material that's written about disease today, when it asks or talks about the cause, it says cause unknown. I don't know if, how many of you ever noticed that in, in medical books, okay? You read it, it says, cause unknown. Well, how are they going to treat it if they don't know the cause, 
Okay? So it's important that we understand the cause. And God has revealed to us what the cause in, is in the book Ministry of Healing on page 128. It says, Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. In case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. Now, it just got done saying it's as a result of a disobedience to laws of health. So what we need to do when we get sick is put a list of the laws of health in front of us and ask ourselves, where am I failing? And once we discern where that is, we need to get on our knees and say, Father, forgive me because I've disobeyed the laws that you wrote for us. It goes on to say that we should... Um, unhealthy conditions should be changed, it says, and wrong habits corrected. Then nature is to be assisted in her effort to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the system. So in this one simple, it's not even a full paragraph, it gives us what disease is and what we should do to correct it. And I praise the Lord for this. It's so simple, really. Even a child can understand it. Okay? And it's a real blessing that we have this information so that if we're willing to correct the un improper habits and help the system to get rid of those impurities, God will bring about the healing. So there's a text that says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they have forgotten the law of God. Hosea 4, 6. Okay? Too many times we forget the law of God. We pride ourselves because we're the people of God, but we forget to put them into practice in our own daily lives. Okay? So, I appeal to each of you today, let's not just remember them, but let's put them into practice. And we will be benefited by them. So we may ask, oh, this is a really important verse. Uh, Moses told the children of Israel that they should repeat the law of God to their children continuously throughout the day in different ways so that they wouldn't forget it because the only way we can remember the law of God is by keeping it in our minds. Okay? And it's interesting because he starts out with the very verse that Jesus used in answering that uh, teacher of the law. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. So the new covenant is that he'll write them in our hearts, right? Actually, it was the original covenant as well. And then it goes on and says, You shall teach them diligently. How? Diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you raise up, you shall bind them as a sign to your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now that shows it's pretty important, isn't it? doesn't it? <laughs> now we know that there are a certain group of people that do tie a, a copy of the Torah to their hand or they carry it on their forehead, but that does no good unless it's in our heart and becomes a, a part of our daily living. Right? So it's important that we learn these things and have them written in our hearts so that they actually show out in our daily living and then we can be in harmony with them. So what are the laws of health? Let's review them one more time. Pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, Trust in divine power. Now it's interesting because this statement says these are the true remedies. Now there's a little change there. I was asking what are the laws of health? Well these are the laws of health. But laws are only laws when we break them. And the law always condemns us. Okay? But the moment we start living in harmony with the law they are transformed then into the natural remedies. Okay? They themselves, as we put them into practice, will bring us healing through the power of him who wrote it. He who wrote it. Our Heavenly Father. Okay? And you'll remember that 
God's law, the Ten Commandments, was written by his finger on the table, table of stones and given to Moses on Sinai. Well, you know what? These laws were written by God's finger on every nerve, every muscle, and every faculty that's been given to humankind. Okay? So, to break one of the laws of health is just as much breaking God's law as to break one of the laws of the Decalogue. Okay? So it's important we understand this and be willing to put them into practice. And then it goes on to say that every person, how many per people? Every person should have a knowledge of nature's remedial agencies and how to apply them. Not just the doctors and nurses. Everyone needs to have this knowledge. And they're simple enough that everyone can. You don't have to spend years and years and years studying them. They're simple to learn and they're simple to put into practice. And God has not left us in darkness. Okay? God is such a loving God. He's given us ample information. And I don't know how many of you have these books, but if you don't have them, I recommend that you get them. You know, Councils on Diets and Foods, Temperance, Councils on Health, the Ministry of Healing, the Ministry of Health and Healing, Selected Messages, and we could go on and on. How about Adventist Home, uh, Child Guidance, uh, Councils to Young People. You know, these books are filled with counsel, not just on how to raise the children and help them to get along in life, but also in relation to health. Okay, there's loads of information on health in these books. And as we read them and put them into practice, God has promised to give us health. And I just really want to encourage each one of you, if you don't have these books, get them. We have the ABC right here. We're blessed. <laughs> Doubly blessed because there's people who live a long way away and have a hard time getting these books. But we're, we've got it right next door here. So there's really no excuse. You can also download them onto a Kindle or on your phone or computer and whatnot. I want to close with this text. This is a marvelous promise. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26. It says, If you will diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God and walk uprightly before him, if you will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases upon you that I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who healeth thee. Let's keep these words in our minds. And as we go through this week, let's make a commitment to come closer to the Lord and ask Him to transform our hearts so that we can delight in listening and doing. And He will bless us.